Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Ray Christensen from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth. And I will be your host for a program tonight on stroke and other neurologic problems. We will be glad to take your calls on headaches, stroke, MS, Alzheimer's disease, and any other neurologic problems. The success of this program is very dependent upon you, the viewer. Please call in your questions and we will do our best to answer them. The telephone numbers for your questions can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Walcott Holt, a neurologist with Essentia Health, Dr. Emily Onello, a family physician at the Lake Superior Community Health Center, and Dr. Paul Sanford, an internal medicine specialist with St. Luke's Internal Medicine Associates. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are Adrian Moen from Brainerd, Minnesota, Caitlin Pulowski from International Falls, Minnesota, and Tori Jordan from Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on stroke and other neurologic problems. Dr. Onella, welcome to Doctors on Call. Uh, and I guess we'll give you the chance to start. Would you talk to us a little bit about what stroke is? Thank you, Dr. Christensen. I think. Uh, I think that's an excellent question because so many patients talk about strokes, but when we really ask them, do they understand what a stroke is, many times there's not as much understanding as there could be. I, I think of a stroke as sort of a heart attack in the brain, meaning that there's a part of the brain that for a variety of reasons does not receive enough oxygen and is damaged uh, permanently. And for that reason, uh, the symptoms of a stroke can vary greatly because it really is dependent on what part of the brain is affected by this lack of oxygen. Um, we think of strokes occurring predominantly in uh, the older population, 65 and older, but you can have strokes at any age. Uh, even children can have strokes. Um, we don't see this as commonly, but conditions such as sickle cell anemia and things can lead to strokes at a young age. Um, I think that uh, the symptoms of a stroke can vary, as I mentioned, uh, depending on the part of the brain affected. And um, the most typical symptoms we, we talk about would be a loss of what we call motor function or the ability to move, the loss of sensory function or being able to feel your skin. And sometimes it can include uh, the ability to speak or swallow. So it really can vary uh, depending on the part of the brain affected. And the other uh, question that comes to mind is what would cause a stroke, and uh, there are a variety of causes, but the most common cause is related to hardening of the arteries and ultimately blockage of the arteries, um, what we call an ischemic stroke, where the artery no longer can uh, accommodate the blood coming through it, and that is blocked. You've opened that up so very nicely. Dr. Sanford, could you kind of move in and talk about uh, prevention a little bit as long as we're covering strokes so well right oh, now? Oh, absolutely. And preventing a stroke is very similar to preventing a heart attack. You want to avoid eating lots of cheeseburgers. You want to, you know, eat, eat your fruits and vegetables and walk 30 minutes a day. Heaven forbid, do not smoke. If you smoke, you're virtually guaranteeing yourself a stroke. Um, if it weren't for cigarettes, Dr. Christensen would be selling Buicks. But uh, the main thing is just eating a healthy diet, reasonable exercise, trying to avoid being overweight and avoiding tobacco. Dr. Holt, one of the other parts of stroke that we don't talk about very much is a spinal stroke. And I've seen a few patients with that. Uh, do you want to talk about spinal strokes just a little bit? Well, spinal strokes are strokes that affect the function of the spinal cord. And what does the spinal cord do? It supplies sensation to the limbs. It controls the bladder. It controls motor power. So that it usually presents uh, spinal strokes usually have a lot of pain and acute and onset of a paralysis below the level at which the stroke. They are seen commonly, for instance, in when they did old types of aortic surgery for aortic aneurysms. They were occasionally occur in people who throw clots, for instance, from bad artery, by bad heart atrial fibrillation. They can occur uh, from vasculitis, such as lupus and and other kinds of uh, inflammatory disease of arteries. When you say below the level, do you want to explain below? Well, if it's in your neck, it would affect the arms and the legs and your bladder. If it was below the neck, it would affect the legs and the bladder. Um, and they're, they're, they can be, they, you, you can have congenital abnormalities of your spine with tangle of blood vessels. 
but uh, they relatively make up less than one or two percent of people who have strokes. So they're devastating because of the damage they do and the, the limited uh, blood supply in that area of the spinal cord. We talked a little bit prior to coming out tonight about Minnesota's initiative on stroke care. Uh, I think uh, the, the state of Minnesota is putting forth uh, an initiative that I've been involved with with the Minnesota Department of Health looking at a more acute care of stroke, much like we did with heart disease in the past. Uh, do any of you want to address that issue? Well, I think the major thing you would, and it's very important to do, is when you have an acute onset of weakness on one side, loss of speech, loss of blindness in an eye, acute vertigo that you haven't had before, that is usually a sign of an impending stroke. Now, it may clear up, but within the next 24, 48 hours, a highly high chance it goes on to completed stroke. And that re those are called transient ischemic attacks, TIAs. And if you have them, you need to be seen then. Now, realizing that 4 to 6 a.m. in the morning is the, is the highest clotting time during a 24-hour cycle, you have them at nighttime. You get up, drag yourself to the bathroom, you come home, come back to bed, and you say, well, it may get better in the morning. It's too late to do anything about it if that's going to go on to a completed stroke. You need to be seen because strokes can be treated with TPA, which is the tissue plasma antigen, uh, antibody, not antigen, but um, to dissolve the clot you already have. You have a 30% higher chance of recovering that stroke if you get that treatment within four to four and a half hours of having, the having these symptoms. So go when you get them. Thank you. Well said. Let's talk a little bit about migraines, Dr. Sanford. Sure. Well, migraines are very common, and uh, it's where you get a blood vessel dilating in the brain, and, and uh, the effect is usually a one-sided pain. Bright light makes it worse. People feel nauseated and just want to crawl into a dark closet, um, and uh, it's probably more frequent in premenopausal women, but anybody can get a migraine. Some migraines occur just in the eyes and don't cause headache, but it will cause a flashy or scotoma change in your vision. Uh, this person, the, the prodrome is in cheekbones, and certainly that can happen sure. also. Do you want to talk a little bit, Dr. Ronello, about trigeminal neuralgia? Uh, it's interesting. You asked that question because when you said cheekbones, I, I think of that as well. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, but I believe trigeminal neuralgia is also called tic yep. Um It is a condition where you have um, uh, extreme um, sudden face pain and often can be, um, I believe it occurs in older individuals, but can be treated, I, th I think, with steroids and often they may even have some surgeries for it now if they believe the nerve is being compressed. Um, um, so I, I would say if, if there's extreme face pain to certainly see your physician and that would be one of the diagnoses that I would entertain if someone came in with that type of symptom. Very good. Any additions? Yeah, I mean, trigeminal neuralgia, the cause of which is not very clear. Um, it, it, I describe it to most patients and they nod yes. It's like a hot poker, usually in your cheek, can be in your jaw. A lot of patients go and see their dentist. They have dental procedures and the pain is still occurring. The treatment is, I would say, at least 70% is successful. They are mostly anti-epileptic anti medicines, but now with the availability to uh, uh, neurosurgical procedures as well as what is called gamma knife which is localized radiation on the trigeminal nerve you have a fairly high success rate of aborting those. I'm going to pull us back to stroke because we've got we started up a bunch of questions on it first of all Wally can you just tell us what a TIA is? Well a transient ischemic attack is an acute localized absence of neurologic function and now most of them present in a sort of stereotypic way. They can have amaurosis fugax, which means acute loss of vision in one eye, usually described as a curtain coming down over one eye. They can last seconds to minutes. Other common ones is acute loss of speech and paralysis down one side. And that, that probably makes up about 70%. They can last anywhere from seconds to minutes to maybe an hour. With the availability of MRIs and other tests, most of them will last longer than that are small strokes. The 
important thing is they warn you that you're at increased risk of having a stroke and you need to do something now, not later, because of the availability of medicines to dissolve a clot and make it better. So Emily, back to our initial discussion about strokes. Uh, the question is, uh, how do you know if it's a dot stroke or a bleed stroke? Ah. New language. I hadn't heard that yes. before. Yes. I'm assuming by dot stroke, the, 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 the collar means a blockage, something getting clot stuck embolic. in the clot. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is a good question, and I, I'm not sure that there is a good way. I don't know. Uh, clinically on the exam, the symptoms might be similar. Um, certainly we use our imaging tools now, and if there's bleeding in the brain, sometimes that can be seen or detected through some other tests. But I think from the standpoint of being a patient and a human, uh, you would not know. And in a sense, I, I agree with my colleagues here, it, in, it does not matter. You want to get in and be seen right away in an emergency room setting. Um, so if that answers the question. You two primary care docs, the question comes up now is, would you give them an aspirin like you do in a heart attack? Ah, Can't go wrong, just chew it down. Yes. Uh -huh. The you answer is yes. You agree? Yes. Even one of the, it might one be a bleed. The, one of the, one of the <laughs> practice parameters for an acute stroke is an aspirin within 24 hours and given in the emergency room, usually at the time of the stroke if they can swallow. And then get them to the hospital. Yes. Um, Questions have come in a little bit about neuropathy. Uh, Paul, do you want to tell us what neuropathy is? Sure. Neuropathy is often a painful or sometimes numb sensation in a hand or foot. Um, can be caused by anything from previous damage, low vitamin B12, low thyroid, uh, sometimes toxins, chemicals. Um, and uh, the real trick is to identify what the cause is and then find a way of fixing it. With low vitamin B12, it's as easy as just supplementing people with vitamin B12. So there are treatments then for neuropathy? Depending on what's causing it, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tough question. Not fair, but I'll put it to you anyway. <laughs> uh -oh. and, and, and the person on your right can come in and answer this a little okay. bit too. What's the link between Lyme and neurologic symptoms, Lyme disease? Aha, that is a tough question. And the question really is, when are doctors going to find the link? <laughs> okay, good. So we're a little bit off the hook here. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly not a Lyme disease expert, but as I understand it, it's a more of a, a disseminated or advanced form of Lyme disease when the infection has reached into the neurologic system. Um, to be honest, as a primary care doctor, I, I do not see Lyme disease usually at that stage, or if I am, I'm not recognizing it to be Lyme disease. So in terms of what causes that, the actual um, cellular cause, I do not know. I defer to my well, colleague. Lyme disease is a spirochete, sort of a kissing cousin of people who get syphilis, but it's different. It presents initially from a tick bite that has to be on the skin for 24 hours. They're not, you know, they're very small, can be missed. About 40% present with a localized rash wherever the tick bite is. And then sometime afterwards, weeks to months, they develop other symptoms. And the most common symptom initially develop is, a, is some pain in joints that fluctuate. Neurologically, the most common one is a peripheral neuropathy, which the most common one is a facial paralysis. I think the, 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 the caller in was concerned uh, talking about Lyme disease is, is what, he, what I call tertiary Lyme disease when, the, when it may no longer just be the infection but the reaction of the white cells to that infection. And people describe having chronic fatigue and chronic confusion related and they're treated long term and they feel better, for instance, on IV antibiotics and then when they're taken off they relapse and they wonder whether they have chronic Lyme disease. That's debatable uh, because of antibody studies, but there is still a raging concern in the, both in the laypersons as well as in physicians as towards whether that's in fact a disease or a change in the overall metabolism related initially to Lyme's. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sanford, <coughs> back to migraine. Can you describe or give us an idea of the difference between migraine and cluster headaches, male, female, that type of thing? Oh, far as Great question. With cluster headaches, you can get headaches that will keep coming. And uh, with a typical migraine, you'll have a single nasty event that dwells there for hours, rarely more than a day. With cluster headaches, you'll have a week where you'll have 
headache after headache after headache. Um, in uh, my geriatric population, we just don't see a lot of that, but you know, my understanding is that cluster headaches happen more frequently in men and migraines more frequently in women. And am I correct, Dr. Holt? Well, yeah, I mean, migraines usually last hours to days. Clusters usually last minutes to hours. Uh, the female-male relationship between migraines and clusters is five and a half, uh, three and a half times more often migraines occur in women. In males, is in, in clusters, it's about five to one males. They are almost, they are always unilateral, by which I mean they're always behind one eye. They never shift, they never go from one side. You can describe a, a cluster headache pain as like a ice cream headache behind one eye. And they're associated with what's known as a Horner syndrome, which is droopy eye, small pupil, and lack of sweating on one side. And they're, they're I think lay people concerned that frequent migraines are clusters. No, they're not. Do clusters cause back? Do clusters cause blackouts? I wasn't aware no, that they, they did. Do, they don't really. They're, they're, I mean, on a, on a, when doctors ask how bad your pain in a zero to ten, it's about a hundred. They're severe pain. It's interesting. There are other differentials too. If people get migraines, don't move because it makes it worse. Clusters have to get up and pace because yeah. they lay quietly. They have even worse pain. Emily, the difference between a brain aneurysm and a stroke? Oh, okay. Well, they're certainly related. Or I are agree. they related? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that when I think of a brain aneurysm, I think of the term aneurysm, which is sort of a stretching or um, uh, puckering out of the blood vessel where the walls are, are thinner and, and it's at risk of rupturing. When that brain aneurysm, which can sit present, I think, even a lifetime and, and be fine, when it leaks or ruptures, however, that's bleeding in the brain, and that would, by de in my mind, definition be uh, the beginning of a stroke, because then the brain tissue downstream from that isn't getting blood anymore because it's leaking out of the vessel prematurely. So uh, it, that's how I think of it. If you want to add anything to that, mm -hmm. yeah. Paul, can herpetic neuralgia mask a stroke? Oh boy, that'd be interesting. Usually, post-herpetic neuralgia or pain along the distribution of where you had your shingles um, will not be associated with any type of motor deficit. It's always going to be sensory. And uh, to have that mask a stroke, I think, would be highly unusual. Well, I think, I think post-herpetic neurology usually occurs somewhere 20 years or more after having shingles. Uh, it's now treatable in the sense that by having the, uh, the uh, varicella herpes zoster vaccination, you can decrease the chance of having it. Um, the problem is it occurs in the same population, usually, that people get strokes. So that it's not unusual. You d usually don't get shingles before the age of 40 unless you're immunosuppressed, like having cancer therapy or something like that. So it may be coexistent rather than causative. Yeah. We talked a little bit about Bell's palsy. It showed up in our discussion on Lyme. And the questions are coming in about Bell's palsy. Is it a stroke? What is it? Uh, and what's a, what, what seems to cause it? Um, any of you want to take that on? Sure. Bell's palsy is an acute paralysis of the face, described by William Bell in 1880. Mm -hmm. And it was felt for a long time to be a stroke. Well, it turns out that more than 50% of it is shingles, what's known as, uh, as Ramsey Hunt. And you will see the shingles on the inside of your ear. And that, that, is, that is antibiotic testing that where you see that the, sh that the varicella, which is chickenpox, and herpes zoster, which is, causes shingles, are related. And that, that it's an in inflammation in one of the sensory relays within your inner ear. And because the facial nerve is right there and you get swelling from that inflammation, it's, the nerve is pinched and you get paralysis where of that nerve, which is in the face. Is there a cure for migraines? Um, boy, oh boy, there are medicines called triptans that can be helpful in trying to abort a migraine. Uh, caffeine, aspirin, turning out the lights can help. As far as a cure to guarantee you'll never get another migraine, no, I don't think it exists. I don't know if you know I would anything. say some people will outgrow them, though. Yeah, you'll see true. hormonal changes over time. Some migraineurs uh, just stop having their migraines after time, but I don't know if that I would consider that a cure. Time may cure it. Why is 4 o'clock a.m. the most common time for a stroke? 
Because the data suggests the clotability of your blood is highest at that period of time. Can super, uh, Emily, can superficial phlebitis cause a stroke? I'm thinking lower extremity. Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, it's, it's a, uh, strokes involve the, generally the arterial system. And I think of phlebitis as affecting the veins. So it would be a, sort of a separate area. Well, I, th I think that I <laughs> superficial phlebitis, inflammation and clotting in the superficial veins are usually so small that if they get in the, into the major veins draining the heart, they don't, they're not big enough to cause it. There's a rare indication where you have a hole in your heart. And you have a hole in the heart normally because before you're born, you're not, you're not supplying your lungs. And that's called uh, paradoxical emboli. They're usually big, big, big veins in the muscles that cause it. And they probably make up less than 1% of all causes of stroke. One has to realize when you do a workup for stroke, 20% of strokes, you never find out why they happen. So 1% or 2%, it's difficult to know. Paul, can a person get rebound headaches? Yeah, I'm sure you can. If you're used to drinking five pots of coffee a day and then you all of a sudden quit, you know, you're going to have headaches, uh, if that's what you mean by a rebound headache. I think that's very likely. I think, I think the important thing to be, realize is if you have to control your headaches, you have to take pain medications or even triptans at a frequency that approaches more than four to seven tablets per week over a period of time, the triggers for the migraines become the, become the wearing off the medicines you took for the preceding migraine as opposed to one of the triggers. And remember, in women, the major trigger is estrogen. It's not progesterone. Another sex hormone is estrogen. And in males, why they get them, the classic presentation of migraines in males is to have bad headaches in your teens and 20s, and then they get better, while women have sporadic headaches in their teens, and then they get worse. And why they get worse is not clear, and they take more medicines, and then the medicines are become the cause of having what we call rebound migraines or medication overuse headaches. Yeah. Okay. You see a lot more when people use butalbital. For, oh, yeah. yeah, and caffeine. Yep. Wally, not to wear you out tonight, MS, <laughs> any new medications or cures in sight for MS? I think from the multiple standpoint, multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is an attack of your white cells against the insulation around the nerves in your brain. And uh, increasingly, the armamentarian, in other words, the medicines that we have to control it, are significant. Okay, the present ones, the initial ones, have been shots, which everybody dislikes. They now have gelanion or flingotamide, which is a pill. The problem with the pill is it's been reported to slow down heart, and you have to be monitored, and the cost is prohibited. But there are a lot of other medicines on the market and, and sort of coexistent with the improvement in rheumatoid arthritis uh, with some of the medicines and sim slightly different. Now we're controlling it much better. And the, the paralysis, the, con the, the bladder control problems, the dementia are increasingly and will be increasingly controlled. So I'm not sure there's a cure, but there's definitely... Uh, hope on the horizon, particularly for people who are now diagnosed with MS, not people who have had scarring from MS long term. Paul, is there a pill for dementia? There's some that have been tried, and uh, you'll hear about Aricept, Exelon, Namenda. How effective they really are is probably debatable. Side effects are often severe, including <coughs> diarrhea. Again, we turn to Uncle Wally. You know, how much are you using these agents? No. Well, I think the biggest problem with Alzheimer's is Alzheimer's is present in your brain 20 years before you ever show symptoms. And so by the time you show symptoms, you probably lost a good 90% of your brain cells, and especially the memory brain cells. And so those medicines slow down the progression, but they're nowhere cured. Now, with some of the newer potential diagnostic questions, maybe starting those 20 years before you ever have the disease will significantly <coughs> limit. You have to realize if we just prolonged or, or stopped Alzheimer's for 10 years, we would take care of the problem. Yep. Is carotid artery, are the carotid arteries uh, subject to causing a stroke and when do you study them? 
Oh, that's a great you question. You've got 30 seconds. Okay, well, that's a, that's a quick <laughs> answer. Yes, they can be. They can be a source of these little uh, dots, I think we called them earlier, or these embolic pieces that can come off. So generally, it is part of an investigation. If someone has had a stroke or a TIA, that's something we will look at to see if they might have some some junk in them, some atherosclerotic change that might be causing the symptoms. So yes, that's a very important part of an, a stroke workup. What a great evening. Thank you so much. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Walcott Holt, Dr. Emily, Emmy, Emily Onello, and Dr. Paul Sanford, and our medical students, Adrian Moen, Caitlin Pulowski, and Tori Jordan. Please join Dr. Alan Johns for a program next week on cancer, when his panelists will be Dr. Jeff Copeman, Dr. Joseph Levine, and Dr. Paul Sanford.